Welcome to Building My Legacy Podcast. This podcast is designed for leaders and entrepreneurs who want to leave a legacy and will provide strategies that focus upon key elements for legacy creation, determining your desired impact and its benefit, increasing your legacy's reach by engaging key stakeholders, planning, prioritizing, and executing. Here's your host, Dr. Lois Sonstegard. Welcome, everybody, to today's Building My Legacy podcast. I have with me today Tim Keen. Tim Keen is interesting in that he comes from the big drums <laughs> in a rock band. He comes from Melbourne, Australia, lives in L.A., and he's a marketer. So he's gone from the big band to uh, marketing. Here's what's interesting about Tim. He had his agency has grown 10 times in the last two quarters. He about 60% of his clients have received funding or been acquired in the last year. Great results. And 90% have increased their revenue by at least 100%. He is focused on high growth within the e commerce area and building those brands. And so, Tim. I want to talk with you a little bit about why marketing from playing in, in bands and touring relative with bands and moving to marketing, quite a switch. <laughs> so what brought, brought that switch about for you? Great question. So I think, I mean, I think initially is the same motivation that most people feel. I mean, the, the deep secret is a car going past the deep secret about being in a band is that no matter what level you're at, even if you're really successful, like we weren't really successful, but we were touring the world. We were like going to Europe four times a year. We were playing major festivals and stuff. I made less money doing that than I made like when I used to work in fast food or when I used to work in a grocery store. Like there is no money to be made in it. It is not, you are the product. Like the band is the product at the end of the line and everyone else is going to get a chunk of that before you get to market. So ultimately, like there really isn't much profit in the industry and, and it, it's very challenging. It's, it's difficult. And I think I moved to LA. That was my first experience of America. I was like, okay, I need to figure something out. I need to learn how to make money now. And I figured out that like, obviously the, and I think this remains true. The best way to make money is to make more money for someone else. It's obvious. And so I was just like setting about how I could learn to do that. Like, how can I learn to do that without going back to school, without uh, massively changing my career? I have a certain amount of technical intellectual knowledge, but I didn't have any like specific knowledge. And, but I am good at learning really quickly. That's, I would say, my main skill in digital marketing. How I, my experience has been that digital marketing is a home for kind of oddballs who know how to learn really, really quickly because the industry is constantly changing. You have to be relatively addicted to the internet. You need to have an understanding of consumer behavior and be able to kind of integrate information quickly. And I just took to it. Like, it's just, I was just like, oh, okay, I know exactly how to do this. I can just keep reading and just go into the internet and then get better and better and better at this. And you can see your results in real time because you're driving revenue for people. So I was just like, just fell into it. And it's funny because I, when I started hiring about six months ago, I hired a couple of people. I hired some people who had a lot of marketing experience and I had a couple, hired a couple more people who were in bands as well. And the band people are massively outperforming the marketing people. They've learned faster. They're driving more growth, delivering results for the business. And I think the reason why is because we're really used to high stress, high stakes environments. We are just used to being working all the time. We're used to adapting to new environments and picking up new skills very quickly. We're used to having to give value before we get paid. Now, all of those things that are like really essential to a marketing career just come naturally to people who have had, who've been in a band or done some sort of like worked at a bar or anything like that. Like it really does help. It makes it easier to do this job. It's been it's been remarkable to see. So you've only been in business as a marketer for three years. Is that correct? Yeah. I made my first dollar online. I think I just posted this the other day. I made my first dollar online February, February 
11th, no, January 11th, 2018. And between then and now, I have driven probably $20 million for brands. My team has driven $100 million. Okay. So what are some of those brands that you have worked with? Are they brands that we would know? So most of these brands, there are a couple of high higher end brands there, but the vast majority of them, I would say, are in the middle range of startups. These are brands that are doing in e-commerce revenue between 50 and $300,000 a month in e-commerce revenue when we find these brands. So what our challenge is, is some of them you might have heard of if, if you're deep in the D2C world. Uh, Trophy Skin was a big success of mine. Hammett Handbags did very well. Grassroots Co-op, still a client of mine. Um, that's They're in the D2C world. There are a few, most of them you probably would not have heard of because they, they're very niche audiences. So what the game is with these brands is, say you have something that's working at a limited scale. You have, you have a brand that's doing 50K a month. You have a brand that's doing 300K a month. Our challenge is to identify bottlenecks and, and blockages and generate more scale, whether that's through Facebook ads or Google ads or uh, email marketing is often a big piece of it. But the, the key point is these are niche properties in that have found success digitally. They've found traction online. They have a replicable way of acquiring customers through paid media, but they don't have the internal resources to scale a growth marketing operation. So when you're involved in a growth marketing program, what does that involve for you? I, I hear um, email, I hear ads, right? Um, it's, I'm guessing there's a combination of that. Do you create the ads also as part of your agency or how do you go about that? Well, it's a really good question because... I think a lot of people get stuck on like, what is growth marketing? Because it's, it's very nebulous sounding, but really it is building a process around driving growth. So it's building, it's identifying what your key metrics are. Revenue is always a key metric and then metrics that fold up into revenue. So metrics that we would look at all the time would be a metric like cost per new customer. How much are you paying to acquire a new customer? Customer lifetime value. How much is that customer worth to you over the entire course of your relationship with that person? Um, MER, media efficiency ratio. How much money are you making compared to how much you're spending on media? Uh, ROAS is a kind of a, a, a metric that is not as useful as it used to be, but we'll look at that. So we'll identify these numbers and build processes around driving optimization and growth in those metrics. So for example... Email is an amazing place to increase your customer lifetime value. Once you've acquired a customer, you can add value to them. You can up- upsell them new products. You can reach out to them if you think they're going to churn. You can send SMSs to them. You can send them customer reviews. But each one of those tactics on its own doesn't do anything. Well, you need a process for identifying which is the best tactic to operate at any point in time and then implement, measure, and iterate on that. And that's the feedback loop that we build for, for, for brands. Got it. So why did you choose e-commerce as your focal point? I got interested in e-commerce. I think early on it was because, well, I, I fell into building websites. I really liked building websites. I had, I had, when I was a kid, I learned how to build websites and e-commerce just was, was exploding as I was coming up. I, it was what I knew. I knew more about products. I understood the idea of a product. I, I didn't have any experience in B2B services. So I looked at, okay, how can I learn to do this? And I got very excited. I initially learned WooCommerce and WordPress and built there. But once I went into an agency, got my first taste of the Shopify ecosystem, I was just like, oh, okay, I'm home. This is beautiful. Because as someone who's been building websites for 15 years, it has never been this easy to build a website. <laughs> it is so easy. You can do it like whoever you are, whether you've never done it before or not, you can do it in an afternoon. Like it's so easy. It's so easy to make a nice website. It's so easy to use baseline, like well-optimized business functionality. And Shopify is just such a robust product. It is 
they've done a really good job of, of integrating core functionality into the product so it doesn't break. Like I'm sure people on this who are listening to this have experienced in their careers working on websites and crashing the server was always like a, a big thing. It was like, we need to have a developer on hand. If we want to make updates, we're going to crash the server. Like the website's going to go down and there is just, it's not going to happen anymore. It's just not a Shopify site will not go down. So the risk falls out all of a sudden you're not doing this. Like, uh, you're not doing a, you're not running a process where everything might fail at some point. It's much simpler and you can be more experimental with it. So it's, it's fun. It's fun. And it's a process you can run with just a couple of people. So I, when I fell into Shopify, I was like, okay, this is great. And it's been such a pleasure to grow with the platform. Over the last three years, there have been massive, massive strides. I mean, the Sh- Shopify share price has increased by like, I don't even, I wish I bought Shopify three years ago, but the Shopify share price, price has increased more than anything. The app ecosystem has really, really developed. There are some great partners out there that make business functionality really easy to do and very, very cost effective and also are just good people to work with. The the ecosystem around this technology is so robust, so friendly, so easy to use that I just don't see why you wouldn't. It's so fun. It's such a good time. Like e-commerce is a great place to be right now. So what do you see happening in the future for e-commerce, especially when you look at what's happening with retail right now? Um, Do you work with both? is do people still do both how is that how does that work together or does it not well one thing to be clear is most brands that come to us are digitally native so most brands started with the online version with the online experience that doesn't mean to say that they don't have storefronts we have worked with quite a few brands who begin online and then are like oh we want to do a pop up oh we want to have a storefront there is still i think value in that storefront experience I mean, I personally am super tired of being on my computer all day. And I think everyone's starting to feel that fatigue as well. So I do think that people are going to, once it's safe, like be really excited about in-person meetups and pop-ups and events and, and, and creating community around the products that they care about. What I do think is here to stay is at a high level, e-commerce revenue as a share of total revenue of total retail revenue grew more in the last six months than it did in the last 10 years. And it's not going back down. People love the convenience. People, it's, it's easier. It's easier and cheaper to have stuff delivered to your house. Amazon is the kind of elephant in the room. They're building that flywheel. They're making it more and more and more normalized and easy and convenient. I, we work with many merchants who have strong Amazon presence but are very nervous about platform risk. Platform risk being Amazon might delist you. Your competitors might downvote your reviews. Your uh, Anything could happen. It's the Wild West out there. Someone might make a fake version of your product. Amazon might make a fake version of your product. You don't have your customers' email addresses. So we're experiencing a lot of people come to us and say, hey, I have this Amazon store. I'm doing 700K, a million dollars a month on Amazon. I would rather do... 200k 300k in shopify because it's better revenue it's right. it's revenue that it, it there's Amazon less people taking a, a buy big portion Ex- right? exactly exactly so i think really what what i think will happen and what is already happening is a emphasis on community around brands community around brands and in community direct personalized interaction and events meaningful events that give value like there may be less retail stores, but there may be more kind of pop-up events or parties or congregations, meetups around the brand. At the same time, people are coming to expect a personalized consumer experience from direct-to-consumer brands. They're coming to expect something more than just a product. They're coming to expect a community or coming to expect... Um, special treatment, whether that's a Facebook group or a Slack channel or a meetup or something that gives them value outside of just getting the product and going to their house. And that's also where we see customer lifetime value. If you can create experience around the brand and keep people in and and give people a real reason to interact with you on the day to day, I think that's brands that are successful in the next 10 years. That's what they're doing. They're building media companies on top of their brands so that they can capture as much attention share as possible. 
So in a sense, when you start building a media brand on top of your product, you're really looking at bringing more systems together in order to push your product out. Exactly. Exactly. You are, you are integrating your content system with your fulfillment system and you are bringing together the marketing and sales and the actual product itself. There's, there's a flattening of like marketing is something we do separately. And then the product, the sales is something we do in the store. They're kind of all becoming the same thing and the end to end consumer experience, the every single touch point from like the first ad to the website to the un- the delivery to the unboxing to the product experience to the post purchase email all that whole experience is under the purview of the marketing team the digital marketing team so there's a lot of touch points and a lot of um ways a lot of opportunities to impact consumer behavior so there's an efficiency that starts to become critical right because you can waste a lot of time in digital oh, yeah. marketing. So you talk a little bit about digital transformation efficiency. Talk a little bit about what that means and how one goes about doing that. Yeah, you've hit on what is, I would say, the biggest pain point for especially established brands looking to transition to selling online, which is that they don't know what to do in what order. There is a lot of things you can do there's an infinite universe of different promotional activities that you could do. You could make a Facebook ad. You could make a Google ad. Do we do it funny? Do we do it serious? Do we put this on the website here? Do we put it on the website here? When do we send this email? All of those considerations uh, take time and they take money. If you are testing this stuff, if you want to go online and build ads and send emails and talk to customers, every single one of those activities costs money. So we see a lot of the time when... Brands are looking to transform digitally. If you're an executive and you are looking to build a a direct-to-consumer business when you didn't have one previously, we see a lot of the time people just getting stuck, just feeling like there's too many things that they could be doing and they don't know which one to do next. And it's not a problem. The problem isn't that there aren't high-quality service providers out there. Problem isn't that there aren't people who know how to run Facebook ads, people who know how to run Google ads. There's a million, infinite people who know how to do that. There, what there isn't on the market is someone who'll tell you which things you should do in what order. And that's what an agency does. That's what we do. It's a strategy layer on top of your business. And everyone's looking for that because of that exact thing. And and we as a content, speaking of content, what we're trying to do is really simplify and make that process transparent. It doesn't need to be super complicated. I think most most teams spend more time thinking about this than they need to. And ultimately, you learn a lot from just doing and, and moving quickly and iterating. And the cost is so low. I think a lot of people who grew up in a different even five years ago, five, 10 years ago, if you were an executive 10 years ago and you were to talk about digital transformation, building an e-commerce business, building a email marketing program, you would be looking at two more zeros on the end of every number than you are now. It is not expensive. So you can let your team just test stuff. Give them a 29, give them a credit card, give them a $29 Shopify store, let them like build something. Like it will be good enough. It's, it is more it's better than the best enterprise software was 10 years ago amazing it's amazing so what trends do you see coming down the pike in the next five years with e-commerce um so community is huge absolutely like build every the high level trend is build your tribe build your community the reasons there's a, a bunch of different reasons why that's happening one is increase in cost of new customer acquisition. This is a big talking point. It is rising. It's becoming more expensive to find new customers. Why is that? It's because Facebook is becoming more competitive. It, people are starting to understand the market. There are a lot of new brands. Every brand is trying to pivot to online. This means that the kind of middle tier of brands that don't don't have an audience, don't understand their customer lifetime value, they're going to get washed out. It is, it, it's relatively expensive to acquire customers. The days of 10 years ago, you could go on Facebook and you could find a new customer for two bucks, three bucks, five bucks. Nowadays, that same customer might cost you $40, $50. So 
you need to have a product selection that appeals to people over a longer time span. You need to have a relatively high average order value and you need to build a community. Like why should people come back to you? What do people care about with your products? The other thing that it should be on everyone's minds is the death of the third party cookie and tracking in general. So we are all used to an ecosystem where all of our activity online is tracked and Facebook in particular, Google also quietly uses that data to serve you very, very hyper-targeted advertising. We as advertisers benefit from that by getting cheap clicks. Basically, our ads are shown to people who are exactly in the right moment, ready to purchase what we're selling because of all of this data that Facebook and Google has on us. The secular trend is away from sharing customer data with large Facebook and Google sized companies. Apple has put a, a line in the sand. They've said like, it's going to be much, much, much more difficult to track users on Apple devices. Google is phasing out the third party cookie. Facebook is already talking about the fact, the idea that the pixel will be phased out. So this is all going to take time, but this is a seismic shift in the way that we do marketing. This will mean a return to fundamentals in a really, really serious way. So fundamentals being... Please. The value proposition. What is the value that your product genuinely provides to people? How clearly and succinctly can you... Uh, get that value proposition across. What is the quality of the creative? The creative is going to matter. Creative already matters way more than people think. The creative being like the literal ads that you show to people, that already matters so much. And people think about it as like, a, oh, we'll figure out the creative later. No, it's the most fundamentally important thing. Uh, if you take half your ad budget and put it into creative for one month, you'll make twice the money, guaranteed. Just, just optimum, like high quality customer experiences speaking to people on an emotional level, talking to customers, figuring out what they need and solving those problems in a relatively low tech way. Like it's not going to be as much about gathering infinite data points, um, figuring out exactly the right metric number. It's, it's going to become much more rough math. And when you're doing rough math, you need to be very like, what does the customer want? Am I providing it for them? Very simple. I'm happy about this change. Uh, we are lucky in that we are right in the right time as an agency where we're very, very agile because we're small enough and we are also very fast learners. So we're a little bit ahead of the curve. So I'm not stressed. But if you, if brands are not thinking about this, this now, they're going to get left behind. One of the things that you talk about is you like to work with companies that have similar values systems. So what kind of values do you look for? when you agree to work with a company? Uh, so we are looking for what we call purpose-driven brands. And I know that's a little bit of a kind of generic term, but what, what we've found is that it self-selects pretty nicely. <laughs> if you come and you say, hey, I think I'm a purpose-driven brand, you probably are, probably close enough, or at least you're in the right ballpark for us to have a conversation. If you come to us and you say, I'm not a purpose-driven brand, I'm, ex I'm explicitly not, it's probably not a conversation that we want to be having. That's not to say you won't find success in the market. Uh, it's just, it's not necessarily a fit for us. So we are looking for people who are interested in paying their employees as well as possible, who are interested in, uh, prog have progressive values, who are uh, kind of, who feel compelled to make the world better, whether that is through their product or through other work that they do around their kind of general being in the world, that's, that's really the consideration for us. It's, it's, would we feel okay about telling our kids that we marketed this product? Would we feel okay about telling our friends that we marketed this product? How well, and then the other part of that is the first piece. Then the other piece is like, what, are you, what is the client? Like, what do you like? And I think people forget about this a lot and the best agencies are very, very particular about who they let into the business because it's such a long-term relationship. We've been working with some of these clients for like three years. Like I talk to these people every week. I talk to these people more than I talk to my parents. Like the agency client relationship is, it's like a marriage and like 
you want to make sure that you're just on the same page, that you get along, that you're respectful, that you uh, have common visions, that you have shared goals and you have a shared understanding of what it's going to take to get to those goals. Not to say that that's always clear at the start of an uh, arrangement. It's something that you kind of tease out over time, but it is important that we're, that there is a, a real alignment um, with brands that we work with and 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 we're very we're very intent on on keeping that so for you the future you've been growing fast what do you see for yourselves in the next three to five years what will your your company look like loop club is is what this is called so what will loop club look like in five years it's really hard to say. It's I mean, it's it's in a really interesting point now where it kind of could be anything. It could be anything. Like the, it, it's such a strong team. It's a very very strong team that really know how to sell products online. And we, I think, in the next three or five years, we can we can get to really whatever scale I think that we all want to get to. I think there's opportunity to. Yeah, I I I, I can see us getting to a. 30 to $50 million business with, without really changing the course that we're on. But the key is what, what are we letting in? What are we allowing to happen? And I think that's where it's going to get really interesting. We have some clients that we work with right now who I can, we could very easily double our business in the next year. And that already opens a whole world of opportunities. Who else do they work with? What other products do they want to bring to market? Can we enter in joint ventures? There are already some people who are doing some interesting work around bringing, like having us kind of more deeply manage the stores. I think I can imagine us in three or five years being, uh, having more of an ownership stake or being closer to the actual store itself. It's a very easy transition to make from serving a client to serving ourselves as a client and kind of building that infrastructure and having having a stake in the things that we build, that's something that's really, really interesting to me. Got it. Okay. So we are almost out of time, Tim. Things that we have not covered that you would like to make sure we leave with the audience. This was really great. And I appreciate your time. If, if people are interested in chatting, I'd love to chat to, love to, love to chat to anyone. You can find me on LinkedIn. That's the best place to find me to send me a message. I'm more than happy to talk to anyone if you're interested in or having challenges around digital transformation, growing an e-commerce brand, specifically in the Shopify space. Uh, I, we can certainly help with okay. if you're if you're trying to do that. There is some, we have a resource for you certainly. So I'd be more than happy to talk to anyone. And for those of you who are listening, we will have information about Tim and his company in the show notes. So you will be able to get information about him. And if you have trouble, certainly contact us and we'll be glad to connect the two of you. So Tim, thank you so much for being with us today. And for those of you who are listening to Building My Legacy podcast, thank you for joining us. And remember to visit our website at buildtomorrow.com and all of our social media sites as well. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. You've been listening to Building My Legacy podcast with Dr. Lois Sanstegard. To book your appointment with Dr. Sanstegard, visit www.buildtomorrow.com.